invitation to uh, present the Brock Lecture uh, tonight. It's, uh, um, I was asked to do this about 12 months ago and so I spent quite a bit of time uh, looking back through the, uh, the very fine records that are held by the Society um, uh, into uh, this exploration and in particular Larry Wells. Uh, we were fortunate, this was, uh, this was a, an expedition that was right towards the end of the Great Expeditions uh, in Australia and the expedition was very well resourced and they took with them a camera. Now that's really uh, unusual in the explorations when people talk about the explorers where they can actually show you the photographs that were taken uh, through that expedition that does give us quite an insight into, uh, uh, into those travels. So I hope uh, tonight I can uh, give you not only a bit of a chronology of um, this expedition itself, uh, and the people, but perhaps particularly through the photographs, uh, a bit of insight into the daily life of these people and how they, uh, how they had to endure out into in, uh, those areas. But this is a map that was prepared by the society at the time, and the pink areas show the great areas that uh, were still unexplored. We had the great Victoria Desert, the um, the Gibson, the little sandy desert, and the uh, great sandy desert further to the north. Um, and remember, uh, remember, South, you know, Australia is about 3,000 kilometres north to south. So, if you consider that, the size of those areas is uh, quite uh, massive. So, they were the areas that were unexplored, and that was really the task given to this exploration: was to try and fill in the gaps, to find out what was left in those pink areas on the map. This was the largest and strongest, best equipped exploration party that Australia had ever put forward. It had 44 camels. They were able to carry 284 gallons of water. And I will talk tonight in the, in the language of, the, um, uh, of their journals. Uh, I do that without apology. So um, I will talk about gallons and miles rather than litres and kilometres, if that's OK with everybody. Um, and. Um, but, you know, you can see from there the, uh, the, uh, it was really quite a, a massive um, group to, uh, to put together and to cart across the, uh, across the desert. They had a lot of scientific equipment. Um, it was a scientific exploration. They were looking to fill in the gaps. They were looking to work out if there was good pastoral country, if there was good mineral country, um, to take weather observations to, to, um, to really work out uh, what that land might be able to uh, uh, might be able to produce. That's as they headed off. They headed off from Warina, which you won't find on the map anymore, but it's up uh, on the Uta Data track. It was the railhead at the time, um, out to west of Cooper Pedy, uh, east of Cooper Pedy. Um, so they took the train up there, they put together the crew, um, got their uh, camels from Beltana Station nearby. Uh, it was a, it was a uh, Beltana was a property that uh, Elder owned at the time and so uh, that's where his camels came from. The first part of their trip they, they were to do, um, uh, head right across to uh, over near what's currently, what's now Wimberley, um, through land that was already explored, land that, that, that had been fairly well um, defined and they didn't try and do any exploration there, they really made a dash across the desert um, to get from the railhead across to their starting point into the uh, unknown territory. But this early part of the trip, there had been reasonably good rains across the part of the trip that was in South Australia, so they enjoyed good pasture for the country and they found plenty of water in the rock holes around the, um, uh, along the route. It was at their second camp that they first encountered um, some of the natives, and I don't mean to be rude by using the term natives again, it's, it's the terminology that was used in the, uh, in the journals. Um, but the natives really were a very important part of this trip. The natives knew where the water was, and as the trip headed further west, they found less and less water and it became more and more important to, um, to have good relationships with the uh, Aboriginal people so that they could direct them to water. They would entice the Aboriginal people with gifts. They would um, uh, food, knives, tobacco, and for some reason, red handkerchiefs. I'm not quite sure what the attraction of red handkerchiefs was, but they do talk about some of the Aboriginal men walking around later on with red handkerchiefs, and that's where they came from. But the Aboriginal people were often quite happy to tag along 
meet up with them and then tag along with them for two or three days and, and they were quite interested in what was going on. This early part of the trip they also in this while the country was quite good, they also saw kangaroos and emus, but as the journal went on, uh, there was less and less talk about uh, uh, any uh, uh, native animals that they were able to um, uh, see or, or um, use on the way through. I couldn't find any record of the actual instrument that was used by Wells, but certainly it would have been something of this nature. That's something from, from that era. Um, a fairly simple theodolite, but very effective theodolite. Um, and with that instrument, they also had altimeters and compass. If somebody had a compass here tonight, it wouldn't have been terribly unlike the compass that was uh, a handheld, uh, a good quality handheld compass. And that's with that, they had to na not only navigate themselves across the country, but map it, accurately map that that land, because if you can't uh, if you can't direct people back to the exact location of the things that you find, it, it, it's not going to be of great value. And it was done with a combination of, of um, surveying skills. Some of it they would just uh, take a bearing to a future to a, a, a far away feature like a mountain, and then head towards it. A lot of it was done with just dead reckoning, just counting up how many hours of travel they had done, and they knew the sort of speed they would they would travel at. They would take as, uh, accurate bearings with their compasses along the way. And then when they did get to some significant hills, they would climb those hills with the theodolite and take accurate bearings to everything that they could see around them. If they could get an accurate bearing to a, a mountain range or some other feature from two or three different places, they could triangulate it and accurately plot it on the map. But I guess what really created the accuracy of the plans was Wells was quite skilled at astronomy. And so he was able to take astronomical observations and get quite accurate uh, latitude, probably less in longitude because uh, that relies on time as well, but certainly very accurate latitudes, very accurate bearing. And because he had an accurate bearing, he was able to get a good, uh, a good uh, deviation of the compass. So the difference between true north and magnetic north, he was able to keep track of that all the way along. And so with those accurate fixes and then the dead reckoning in between with a bit of, um, a bit of skill, um, they were able to uh, retain very good records um, and, uh, and um, not only were their records uh, accurate, they were, he was actually able to, when he came across uh, land features from other surveyors, he was able to correct some of the earlier work from other surveyors that was found at times to be 10 to 15 miles out. Mm -hmm. um, so it really was, uh, he really um, did have a, a talent in surveying that uh, probably most of the other explorers uh, didn't have. In the early, early 1980s, a colleague of mine, a surveyor, Jeff Sample, um, and, a, and a friend of his, headed out into the desert looking for that tree. Um, they believed it to be one of the most remote of trees of the explorers, uh, and they used modern surveying equipment. Um, this is some aerial photography they used. They mapped the descriptions from Wells about the distance between the sand hills and his latitudes, and mapped out across it on the aerial photography where they felt that tree was. They overlaid that into the topographic plans and tried to work out the exact position where to go and find that tree. Jeff in his deliberations concluded that the records of Wells were of a high degree of accuracy. And he did in fact get to what he believes was the Corridon tree that was marked. He couldn't find any markings on it. Uh, perhaps. Um, Perhaps 90 years was just too much for that tree and it's well and truly grown over and the, the uh, seam is no longer, um, no longer visible. But um, in Jeff's reckoning, that was the, uh, the tree that Wells had uh, marked. They got to the southern end, again blazed the tree and then headed back to the north-northwest to meet up with Lindsay. Because it, they, it was quite a, quite a long trip, Lindsay had started Lindsay had left a, uh, a, a large stone can with a 15 foot pole on top of a mountain for Wells to find on his return so that he could, could get to rejoin the caravan. And they set fire regularly to large piles of spinifex so that uh, Wells would see the smoke and be able to take a bearing to their camp. Um, from Wells' records, he found he saw none of those, but he did come across the camel track. But I do find it rather remarkable that you can go away for three weeks, head off south, head back north-northwest, 
and one afternoon while you're just plodding along, come across some camel tracks and say, oh, that must be where they're going and join up with them. It's really, uh, it really does, uh, I find it really rather remarkable. So that trip, they travelled for 18 days, 388 miles, and they found hardly any water. They had to just rely on the supplies that they had taken. Water, water like most of the expeditions, was their major problem, trying to find enough water. The country, like I say, by the time they got to the Western Australian border, they were in severe drought, country, about drought affected country. At this point, they were starting to just look for the, the smoke of the Aboriginal people, head towards the smoke, try and uh, create some rapport with the Aboriginal people and, and find some water. It was really only at these type of rock holes, a native world that's been shored up, was the uh, only source of water once they were out here. There were certainly no creeks. The Aboriginal, some of the Aboriginal people in some of this country were living on the water from tree roots by this stage. They did find a number of Aboriginal carvings and Aboriginal paintings. This was one of the photographs, quite a striking rock. Um, they can be found a similar type of rock up in the, Abri up in the Flinders Ranges and uh, uh, in the uh, stuff I've seen in national parks. And they've been listed as uh, those sort of, uh, that sort of painting is from uh, uh, traditional women's um, um, rituals. But they did, um, they did certainly um, try and document as much of that type of, uh, uh, that, as much of that as they could. There was a place called Skirmish Hill as they crossed, the, crossed over into Western Australia. And here they found a tree that's probably the most, um, uh, probably the, the most remarkable tree in Australia, I think. Um, it was marked by Goss in 1873, by Forrest in 1874, Mills in 1883, and then uh, Lindsay came along and marked it for this expedition in 1891. So that tree has four <coughs> great explorations, all marking the same tree. Obviously it's near water, um, but certainly, um, I don't know whether it still exists, it's not a very significant tree. Um, it would be lovely to go and find out if it's still there. Though. It was also in, at this tree that they found the coldest night, 13 degrees below freezing. So um, now that will be 13 Fahrenheit, not centigrade, but that's still pretty cold. Often with this expedition they talk about the lost tribe. And I must say it's hard to find out a great deal about it, but I found two examples. Um, in 1961, National Mapping Surveyors up near Canning Stockroot came across this troop of Aboriginal people. Uh, they were living a, a traditional life, the same as Wills and Lindsay had found in 1891. They were still living that traditional way of life. This is 1961. And those people too were prepared to show them their water supply. It was water to those people that was uh, critical. And I guess perhaps more relative, more uh, more critical to this group was this is in uh, from a newspaper article in 1986. Now I think if I look around the room, everybody here was will remember 1986. Um, it's not that long ago for us. Seven Aboriginal people they were found in the Great Victoria Desert of Western Australia, except for the old man. Um, none of the group had seen a white man. So six of those people had never seen a white man. And these people where they were found was right near Skirmish Hill, right where I'm now talking about Wells Trip uh, going. But by now they were into August and they had uh, the camels had only had six gallons of water in three weeks. Lindsay had to make a decision here. Would he, um, sorry that photograph is near, what is near Fort Mueller, but that's taken in a very good year and that's not what it looked like while he was there. He had to make a decision. Should he continue west, which was his instructions from the society, or should he go to somewhere where he knew there was water? And the nearest place they knew of water was Victoria Springs, 400 miles away. But Giles had warned that it was very hard to find, and so it was quite a risk to head down to there. But they decided that was their only option. There was nothing ahead. They, they were really uh, doubtful if they headed west that there would be uh, any, uh, any more water. So they sent Wells off, he went, he went down along that route to try and find some water. He found a place where he had 300 gallons of water and Lindsay made the decision that that's where they would go. They headed off by the time that the camels got down to the place where there was 350 gallons of water, there was hardly any left. 
And um, um, so all the camels got was a short drink of dirty water. They continued on, and this probably gives you a bit of the scale of what they were trying to achieve. Um, you know, 400 miles from there to there, across some, some terribly harsh country. Um, only that one drink of camel water for the camels, that's all they found. Um, it's really quite a remarkable uh, journey to go that far. They got, they got to the southern end, and Wells got up one morning and said, I think we're close. We'll be close tonight, so that night he took astronomical observations and he determined that they were they travelled 27 chains too far, so about 500 metres too far south. And he was quite confident that they were east of Victoria Springs. So they got up the next morning and headed off under Wells' instructions of where to find the spring. Giles had described very well the country of where the spring was, and they got to a sandhill where they could see across plane and matched perfectly the description that um, Giles had given to the, uh, to the spring. And they came across the spring to their great delight. The spring had collapsed. They got a sharp stick and poked it in and they found that there was water down there, so they started to dig it out by hand. They dug all afternoon, they dug all night till midnight, and they only managed to get 50 gallons of water and the well collapsed, it was in uh, quicksand and the well collapsed at that point. So they had travelled, the camels by then had had one gallon of water after 24 days of travelling and when they got to the water hole, it had insufficient supply for their needs. So like all good doctors, he opened the bottle of whiskey <laughs> and they all cheered wells because really it was a remarkable feat of, of surveying travel that distance and, and hit, uh, be able to, 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 to find something that had been described as very difficult to find out in the desert. So just some quick facts to, uh, uh, in winding up. Um, they travelled for, for a year. They covered 4,000 miles. 2,700 of those miles were unexplored country. They mapped out 80,000 square miles of land. And that in, in itself is just a remarkable, a remarkable um, feat. They had done all of that across one of the great deserts of Australia, in fact the largest of Australia's desert, the Great Victoria Desert. And at the return of that loop, Wells was instructed to disband the expedition and return to Adelaide. A remarkable person, I think, from uh, my reckoning, probably one of the greatest technical surveyors as, who operated as an explorer. His accuracy was uh, well recognised, has, has been proven to be uh, a, a good accuracy. Um, he carried good equipment with him, uh, good survey equipment rather than just navigation equipment, allowed him to get some, some very fine results. Um, so truly a remarkable, uh, a remarkable uh, man. Uh, this expedition I think was uh, quite remarkable to travel uh, you imagine in one year if somebody gave you a few camels and said walk to Perth and back, I think most of us would think that was a fair, a fair feat, but um, he didn't, at the time, he would even remember he was heading into places that he didn't know what was there. So thank you very much for your attention tonight. And, uh, I hope that you